George, it's good to see you. Uh, I wish we can say we planned it this way, but today is the winter solstice and the unique conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. I think it's the first time in 400 years, and even then they couldn't see it because of the weather, so it may have been 800 years before uh, since people have actually seen it. And it, it gave me pause for thinking the contrast between what the ancients saw in the sky as major things of importance or uncertainties and the remarkable transformation we've had uh, to what you've called and what now everyone calls precision cosmology. So as we, as we begin to talk, uh, how, do, how do you reflect on this, uh, this grand human adventure to understand the universe? Well, I think about it, and I usually end up with three different sort of personal view, depending on what frame I'm talking about. Like, this is the stuff that has come from this, right? Thousands of people are now working on an area which wasn't even worked on when I got started on it. And there's other things like, well, people are doing things that we used to put as memos and they're writing papers about it and all this kind of stuff. This, this, I have different feelings at different times about what's going on. But let me go back to your opening, which is, the planets aligning. You know, usually we, we, we meet because the stars align. This time we meet because the planets align. And it's actually quite spectacular because it's not just any planets. This is Jupiter and Saturn. And they're really two of the brightest planets in the sky. And they're coming so close together tonight that it's really sp spectacular to see. So the thing that you could say is anyone, any human being was going to be awed by that kind of a, of a thing. And that is something that we share with our ancestors and with everyone else. And, but now we can see many more things in the sky and know much more about the universe than our forebears could. We've, we've evolved in the last you know, decades to where we have an understanding of how the universe came into being and how it's developing and where it's going. And that's really a spectacular thing. And so, when I started out in, the, in doing cosmology, I did it because I knew it was going to be frontier science and the new instrumentation and new ways was going to make it possible to do, to, to make advances. Um, but most of the things we knew about cosmology, you could talk about in 45 minutes to a lecture of students and you could tell them everything that you knew and it was all on three pieces of paper and uh, that's all. That you, and most things weren't known very accurately. And when I say not very accurately, they were astronomy accurate, factor of 10, that kind of stuff. A few things maybe were known to a factor of two. One of the things that is still sort of controversial in a much different way was the Hubble expansion rate, it's called the Hubble constant. You know, how fast is the universe expanding when it is? Which tells you how, how fast it's cool. expanding and, and, the, and the age of the right. universe. Well. Right, and, and, and there were still some people that didn't want the universe to expand, but by then most everybody had accepted that. And it's very, it turns out that it's, there's only a few key numbers that let you describe the universe. And what happened when we made the discoveries with the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, COBE, we ran in the position where we were able to take our maps of the sky and then turn around and reduce them, eventually these small number of things, basically six numbers. But we were able to measure them with a precision that went from factor two to factor 10 down to where we were talking about 10%. And so I was uh, <laughs> enthusiastic <laughs> to say, now we're doing precision cosmology. Because I always told my students, you're doing science when you're doing numbers and you're getting them accurately. That's how you know you're doing science, right? But let me get the Everything else is just hand waving, right? Let me get the historical framework for this. I mean, th I think you started in, in, in what, what was then precision cosmology at a much lower level, uh, using balloons and aircraft. Uh, and to, to, as a, a first effort to that, I actually remember those days. I'm, I'm that old. Um, but then Kobe was a, a huge a development. So that I think it was launched 1989, 1993. So just give a sense of, of, of that process, because that was the transformation. It got better and better with WMAP and then Planck, but Kobe was the foundation. Well, the, the transformation was when we discovered with Kobe that you can see these small variations through the electric radiation from the Big Bang. We can see the small variations that eventually were going to grow 
to become the galaxies and clusters of galaxies and larger scale structures, but also give us a hint about what happened in the early universe. And once you had that, then the theorists got all excited saying, if you make these measurements this accurately, you can determine this about what went on and that. So very quickly, we came to understand that by making more and improved measurements, we'll be able to measure the parameters of the universe very well. And I can remember by the time we got to the end of COVID and WMAP was getting ready to be on, I said, with WMAP, we're going to be getting to the point where we're measuring the universe as well as you do, as a tailor does when he measures your suit. Wow. That is, okay. you know, they measure you and they make a suit for you and they put it on, right? Well, we had a model of the universe and it fit as well as a good handmade suit by okay. that time. Now, Planck has come along and moved us, you know, from being at the at the many times level to the 10% level with Kobe to closer to the 1% level with WMAP. So with Planck, many of the things are at the tenth of a percent level, right? But now we're limited by do we have the right model, the right theory of what's going on in the universe? Was there something we left out or something like that? But it's quite it's quite impressive uh, how much advance has come. And each of those satellites were about 10 years apart. They had 10 years better technology, 10 years better understanding of how to do these measurements, and a lot more excited, bright young people to work on it. So that's that's a recipe for success. Now, originally, the 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 the, the beginning concept was the microwave background, which was discovered in the 60s, uh, Nobel Prize at, from Bell Labs, where they thought it was noise at first, and then they realized it was something more than noise. It was the background of the universe, but originally they thought it was it was it was uh, uh, flat. It was it was uh, homogeneous, uh, and that the innovation that that you came with showed that there were these very small differences. What is it? One in a hundred thousand uh, variations, and those were the the key. Once you had that, then you can really develop something. Because if it was all homogeneous, if uh, you know there's there's just right. one idea, but once you have the variation, then you can really get into it. What's exciting about it is the universe is very uniform. That says you can make a very simple model of it, but then it had these very small perturbations. So that means you can make a very simple linear model with just small perturbations. So the math is easy as well as doing the, the understanding of it. The hard part is making measurements at that, mm. that high precision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So uh, and so what I'd like to understand is, uh, from the data, and it's it's calculated. You know, three decimal points. You can get the age of the universe, the distribution between ordinary matter, dark matter, and dark energy. You know, a little less than five percent is what we call or, ordinary matter that we think is everything, but it's less than five percent of the total energy uh, density of, of the universe. And I've seen all those numbers, but what what? How can you go from the data? Of the, of the of the satellites, the three satellites, COBE, WMAP, and Planck. What does it give you that enables you to make those calculations of the age of the universe and, and the, uh, the, the, the energy density? Ah, okay, this gets a little more complicated. So the first is the universe is pretty uniform. The universe is, if you think about a sphere compared to the earth, the earth is rotating. So it's a little bit of a late, and it also has some mountains and other stuff on it. It's, it's uniform to sort of on the scale of a few in 4,000, right? So it's, it's on a scale of a part in a thousand. The universe is a hundred times more smooth than that, mm. but there are these very small variations. That's why it turns out to be easier to do calculations about how the universe formed than how the earth formed first, because it's, it's much more linear. Second of all, there's less complicated stuff that goes on in a certain way. So what you're able to do is look at these variations, determine what they must have looked like at the beginning by measuring them carefully with a cosmic microwave background. But even when you're looking a relatively short time after 300,000 years or 380,000 years after the beginning, it's still 14 billion years to now. So it's, if you're if it's, if like a human, it's like six hours into their, you know, the embryo's lifetime is where you're looking at it. It's very, very, very early. You're able to see some of the variations that happened early, and you can start seeing 
how it behaves. And I, an example I give is if you ring a bell, you can hear this tone and you hear this, you know, after it's been ringing for a tiny amount of time, you hear a fairly pure tone if it's a good bell. And if you can see the size of the bell or you have no something else about it, you can tell what it's made out of by the sound, by the frequency of the bell. If you have a steel bell or a silver bell or a brass bell, all physically the same size, they will ring different. So you can tell what the universe is made out of by how these, these tiny variations are oscillating in the early universe. You can tell uh, what the fluctuations are as a function of scale by looking at different scales. You can look at all the data you have by making a careful map of the very early universe, and you can determine what's the geometry of the universe and what is the universe made out of, as long as you understand what kind of things it can be. So that's why we know about dark matter and ordinary matter and uh, light and things like that, neutrinos. We put all those in and we fit to them and we can determine those things very, very precisely. But it's understanding the same way that people who are skilled musicians or whatever can look at bells and so forth and determine what they're made of or how they're going to sound when they when they hit them. It's the same kind of experience. How, how many different uh, metrics or parameters of the uh, small variations do you measure in terms of the spectrum or the, the intensity of uh, how, how many different ways of looking at the variations do you need to make those calculations? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a how greedy you are and how small you want your errors to be. It's a so what we try to do with Planck, uh, and a lot of that happened not so far from where I am right now, um, but what we tried to do with Planck is map the entire sky with a very good resolution, so with 10 million pixels. So if you print it or, on a, you know, or show it on a normal screen, you don't have as much resolution as the map we made of the sky with Planck. Mm. And so there we're talking about 10 million pixels and we've measured it at nine different frequencies, nine different wavelengths. So you can separate out what signals might be coming from the galaxy or extra galactic sources and what is coming from the beginning of the universe. And so what you do is a complicated analysis where you reconstruct the images you see the sky, then you sort them across the different wavelengths or the different frequencies you're talking about and separate out the components until you have what you think is a map of the primordial universe. You also have a map of the galaxy and a map of other extra sources. And um, when you do that, uh, you, uh, you're able then to try and understand it. I'm sorry, my security system is <laughs> sending me messages. Um, when you do that, uh, you, you're able then to try and say, okay, what are the various constituencies? Well, you will see that what you see is on large scales, there are fluctuations that are roughly the same amplitude everywhere. And then for some reason it peaks up and then there's peaks at the harmonics. Those are just the natural frequencies of the universe, just the way ringing a bell has natural frequencies or a wine glass or whatever. There are some that have very pure tones. The universe doesn't have very many losses, so it has a lot of very pure tones. By measuring those tones, you're measuring the geometry of the universe. In this case, the time from the beginning of the universe to the time you, you make the image, but also what it's made out of, what's the material of the universe. And so you fit to all these in different, you know, through different ways. And you look to see, is it consistent in this part of the universe and that part of the universe? So you get the same answer. You can then add it all together, right? And get better statistics and get a more and more precise measurement. And so it's a, it's a consistency check, it's a, thinking it through carefully. And did I include everything that needs to be included? And so when we're doing this, we're usually doing it with six or seven major parameters, you know, like how much is the dark energy? How much is the dark matter? How much is ordinary matter? How much is these various aspects? Plus, is there a slight tilt of the spectrum, right? So first approximation, you say there's no variation with the amplitude of fluctuation that originally put in there. But then you say, all right, if we think of a more sophisticated model, there'll be a slight tilt to it. We take that into account. And then what's the amplitude and so forth. So you put these extra parameters in. So there's typically seven or eight, and there's some nuisance parameters in case you've got a background or something else you put in the average over. But you're, you're basically just fitting to a small number. 
And so you start with 10 million pixels and then you do a test, is, this, is the universe isotropic? Because you'd have 10 million numbers to describe on it. If it's isotropic, you can collapse that from two dimensions to one dimension, which means you can do the square root of 10 million, <laughs> which is very handy. It gets you down to the, you know, 3,500, thing, 3,000 things. And that's what your basic measurement is, is, is the, those numbers. But then you're fitting six numbers to smooth curve that runs through those numbers. And so it's a, it's a complicated process, uh, but simple in a certain conceptual way, but difficult in the, actually carrying it out and make sure you got it right and you, you remove the systematics carefully and everything. This may sound like a very naive question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What of the six, seven parameters that you use enable you to make this what seems to be a, a, a massive uh, distinguishing between ordinary matter, dark matter, and dark energy? These are, are vastly different kinds of things. And so how can you differentiate between those? Okay. So there is a phenomenon that we physicists call baryon acoustic oscillations, which is, is shorthand for saying ordinary matter and light uh, are coupled very well by electromagnetic force. You know, light tries to shine through the sun, it hits a plasma and it does that. So the light, the early universe is a plasma, light tries to get through it, hits the electrons, but the electrons are electrically coupled to the protons or the helium nuclei. So there's an oscillation between those three fluids, basically. And they, they make a baryon acoustic oscillation. The light is very powerful in the early universe. It's much stronger and there's more energy in it than there is in the matter. And it actually tries to blow stuff apart. And you end up now, we see residual uh, spheres of galaxies around a big perturbation. If there was a big perturbation, which was a big cluster of galaxies and dark matter, and they, they were starting to form together, the baryons get pushed way out. They get pushed out to millions of, of parsecs, that is millions of, with 3.26 times that is light years. It's many millions of light years, these things get pumped out, and then the light is free to go and they are, they can form. And a lot of the baryons fall back in on the dark matter, but some of the others don't. And so when you look at that, you can look very carefully, the dark matter has a slightly different behavior in these bumps and lumps that are formed, than the ordinary matter. So the ordinary matter goes up and down, you know, the first harmonic, second harmonic, third. It goes up and down the opposite direction than the dark matter. The dark matter just goes up. More dark matter, all the peaks go up. The, the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic. But the, 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 the baryons, the ordinary matter, they go up on the first peak, but down on the second peak and so on. So when you increase or change them, they distinguish them. And so because of that, you can do that, but it's, it's, you know, it's not an intuitively obvious thing. You have to sit down, oops, sorry, I threw my, uh, my, my uh, iPad on the floor <laughs> by accident. Um, so when you go through and look at this, you have to reason through it carefully and see how they behave. And then it's easy to make up a diagram that shows you that adding matter makes the, these lumps that appear that are trying to appear or trying to form bigger. But the, the, the ordinary matter gets blown out by the light and that causes then the, the harmonics from the dark matter, they all get bigger when there's more dark matter. The harmonics from the ordinary matter, the first one goes up, but the second one goes down, the third one goes up. Fourth. So even odd kind of difference. Because of those, you can distinguish them and really tell them apart. Okay, now there are other reasons. That's great between ordinary matter and dark matter, but how about dark energy? Is that just a subtraction of what's left over, or is there some is there some characteristic? Uh, uh, so you have to say when you have to ask this question when because yeah, before true. we were saying, huh, the universe looks flat, but the matter doesn't add up to yeah. make it flat. So there must be some more energy somewhere to yeah. make the universe flat because Einstein's you know general relativity tells us the sum of the matter has to be the sum of all the matter or the, all the energy, the matter plus energy. So MC squared plus E, all that has to add up to the critical energy density. And there was some missing, right? Uh -huh. And so we would say there must be something we're not seeing. 
and and we see it because because we're measuring it to be flat, but we're not measuring enough matter, right? And uh, it was then the fact that the supernova, you know, started showing that the universe was, you know, accelerating and getting to be expanding faster and faster now, and uh, all all that fit together. Very, you know, there was a little bit of objection at the beginning. But everybody in the field saw it fit together with all the matter, the data we were having. It made the universe the right age. It made the universe flat. It made it made everybody kind of happy, and so they, they were happy to adapt the, the 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 dark energy. But we still have to find out what it is. But the uh, it, it got accepted much more quickly than some things get accepted, and so we didn't see at the beginning that it had to be dark energy. We just saw that there was missing energy. Now, with the, the, the good results from Planck and now some of the large ground-based experiments, we're getting enough precision that we can actually see evidence for the dark energy from looking at the cosmic microwave background itself. The relegation gives us some information on that. But now you have many more. You have the large-scale structure. You have you know the, the clusters of galaxies are telling us, the supernova are telling us, a number of things are telling us that there's the dark energy. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.